The level of the superior iliac crest corresponds to the interspace between the fourth and fifth lumbar vertebrae in most adults. Mark the level of the superior aspects of both iliac crests. The spinous processes of the vertebrae project out from the backbone. You must slip your spinal needle between these projections. Flexing the back forward opens up a space through which the needle can slide. Next position your patient in the lateral decubitus position. Keeping the shoulders aligned with the plane of the back, your patient should flex his or her knees toward the chest, bend his or her head downward, and arch out the back. At the level of the superior iliac crest, palpate for the soft interspaces between the firm spinous processes. Mark this spot. Now open your spinal tray. Everything inside the outer package is sterile. You can unwrap the first three layers before you put on sterile gloves. Most prepackaged lumbar puncture trays contain a standard 20 or 22 gauge, three and a half inch spinal needle, a manometer, stopcock, gauze sponges, sponges to apply the antiseptic, specimen containers, local anesthetic, syringe, 25 and 22 gauge needles to inject the anesthetic, plus a band-aid. Usually the tray does not contain a liquid antiseptic. Povidone iodine, which is betadine, is the most commonly used antiseptic. Pour the betadine into the appropriate receptacle in the tray. After you have put on sterile gloves and unwrapped the fourth layer of covering for the spinal tray, wash your patient's back with betadine. Apply the betadine first at the spot you have chosen to insert the spinal needle. Warn your patient the betadine may feel cold. Paint the area surrounding this spot with progressively larger circles of betadine. Repeat this application two more times. Use firm pressure. The force of friction may help reduce the bacteria count on the skin. Slip a sterile drape under the patient. You won't contaminate your gloves if you allow a portion of the drape to fold over your hands. Prepackaged spinal trays contain a fenestrated sterile drape. A strip of paper protects a line of adhesive on this drape. Peel away this strip. Cover your patient's back with this drape, aligning the opening in the center of the drape over your proposed puncture site. Firmly press the adhesive on the back of the drape against your patient. Adjust the drape appropriately. At this point, some physicians recommend changing to a fresh pair of sterile gloves. Wipe away the betadine. Some physicians think that washing off the betadine reduces the incidence of post-puncture headache. Palpate the back once again to confirm the level of your chosen interspace. Draw up the local anesthetic into a syringe. Warn your patient that the anesthetic may burn when it is injected. Using a 25 gauge needle, inject about a half a milliliter of anesthetic into the superficial tissues. Replace the 25 gauge needle with a 22 gauge, one and a half inch needle. Anesthetize the deeper tissues. Remember to aspirate back on the syringe, looking for a blood return before you inject. You do not want to inject anesthetic into a blood vessel. While the anesthetic is taking effect, arrange your sterile specimen containers in sequence from one to four remember to unscrew the caps. With the bevel of the needle parallel to the long axis of the patient's back, insert the spinal needle at your chosen interspace. Use both hands to steady the needle. As you advance the needle, angle it toward the umbilicus. Periodically remove the stylet to check for fluid return. Whenever you change the position of the needle, replace the stylet. If you don't replace the stylet, you might catch a nerve root in the hollow needle. If you have difficulty obtaining a fluid return, replace the stylet, pull the needle out toward the skin, 
and advance at a different angle. Often you will be successful if you direct the needle more toward the patient's umbilicus. You may feel a sudden change in resistance when you pop out of the ligamentum flavum. When you feel this, remove the stylet. Note the color and clarity of the CSF dripping from the needle hub. Attach the stopcock to the manometer and then to the hub of the needle. The lever of the stopcock points to the side that is closed. Turn the lever toward you. The CSF will now flow into the manometer. Note the level to which the CSF rises. If the opening pressure is high, ask your assistant to straighten your patient's legs a little to see if the pressure drops to normal. An increase in abdominal pressure will falsely elevate the opening pressure. Remove the manometer. Your setup will be more manageable without the heavy manometer. Now collect between 1 milliliter and 4 milliliters of CSF in each specimen container. Send one tube for gram stain and culture. CSF protein and glucose can be ordered on another tube. To interpret the CSF glucose appropriately, a simultaneous serum glucose should also be obtained. Cell count and differential should be ordered on another tube. Usually one to two milliliters of CSF in each tube is sufficient for the laboratory to run these tests. To adequately test for multiple sclerosis, you should collect four milliliters of fluid. To adequately culture for fungus or tuberculosis, at least 20 milliliters of fluid is preferred. Remember to screw the caps tightly onto the specimen containers or the fluid may leak out during transport to the laboratory. Remove the stopcock, replace the stylet, remove the needle. Cover the puncture site with a band-aid.